Nords are an impressive, often imposing sight. Tall of stature, strong of bone and thick of muscle, they are the children of the sky. They call Skyrim the throat of the world, because it is where the sky exhaled on the land and formed them. They see themselves as eternal outsiders and invaders, and even when they conquer and rule another people, they feel no kinship with them. The breath and the voice are the vital essence of a Nord. When they defeat great enemies, they take their tongues as trophies. These are woven into ropes and can hold speech like an enchantment. The power of a Nord can be articulated into a shout. The strongest of their warriors are called tongues. When the Nords attack a city, they take no siege engines or cavalry. The tongues form in a wedge in front of the gatehouse and draw in breath. When the leader lets it out in a key eye, the doors are blown in and the axemen rush into the city. Their shouts can sharpen blades and galvanize men. They can stop charging warriors and summon storms with a single roar. The most powerful Nords cannot speak without causing destruction. They must go gagged and communicate through a sign language and through scribing runes. The further north you go into Skyrim, the more powerful and elemental the people become, and the less they require dwellings and shelters. Wind is fundamental to Skyrim and the Nords. Those that live in the far wastes always carry a wind with them. Carving an empire of men from a continent ruled by elves is no small feat, and while the hardy, brave, warlike Nords may have lost some of the legendary renown their forebears of old possessed, there has never been a time when the men of the North were not besieged by adversity. But that is the beauty of the Nords. Just like the perilous province of Skyrim, the Northmen prosper in times of hardship. Every battle makes them more powerful and more permanent. They are a mighty, unyielding race, and you need only look at their great heroes to see that. Every Nord yearns for Sovngarde, for a place in the Hall of Valor, and I'd say that feasting hall must be pretty crowded by now. Their songs of glory ring through the rafters, and their stories of mortal splendor are shared over horns of mead and spit-roasted oxen. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. In this series, I'm counting down the greatest members of every Tamrielic race, and I don't think any list so far can rival the Nords for talent. There are so many brilliant Nords to choose from, and with the exception of some honourable mentions, I struggled to narrow the list down to 10. Every great Nord on this list could be number one if they were born into another race, and that just goes to show how strong the stock is in Tamriel's frigid northern expanses. So how about we get right into it with our honourable mentions. The following Nords achieved a great deal, but just fell short of a place in the top 10. Our first few honourable mentions ruled Skyrim consecutively. Each of these High Kings built their legacies in the 5th century of the Fourth Era. The first was named Olaf One-Eye. He was a great warrior and excelled as the Jarl of Whiterun. Unfortunately, his fall from grace would forever mar his previous accomplishments. As Whiterun's Jarl, Olaf sprung a trap upon the foul-tempered dragon Numenex within his palace, which was subsequently dubbed Dragon's Reach in honour of the feat. Numenex was an old and belligerent dragon who spent most of his waning years terrorising the countryside. Jarl Olaf's patience had run out, so he confronted the dragon atop Mount Anfor, where they engaged in a blustering shouting match. Once Numenex was weakened, Olaf lured him to Whiterun and captured him. Numenex lost his sanity during his imprisonment, and when he died, his head was mounted above Dragon's Reach's throne, where it remained suspended to the present day. Olaf's fame would eventually see him crowned High King. His 32-year reign was not short of controversies, the most notable of which involved the seditious bard Svaknir, who wrote a scathing verse decrying him as a fraud and a tyrant. Olaf imprisoned the singer and destroyed every known copy of the verse. Svaknir's claim threatened Olaf's seemingly impenetrable reputation. Svaknir asserted that Olaf had not truly duelled Numenex, but rather stumbled upon the old dragon when he was already weakened and unable to fight back. Bards throughout history celebrate Svaknir's defiance by burning an effigy of High King Olaf. Olaf was undoubtedly controversial, and perhaps many of his achievements were exaggerated or even fabricated, but he had reunited Skyrim after the bloody 51-year-long War of Succession. Had he not taken the weight of the province on his shoulders, Skyrim may have been entirely lost to her opportunistic, land-seeking neighbours. The next honourable mention is Olaf's successor, Kjorik the White. 
Kyorik was an unlikely monarch, for he was soft-spoken and ill-favoured against his rival, a warrior named Azern Icebreaker, who was supported by his peers. But the Crown of Verity, which replaced the Jagged Crown after it was lost in the War of Succession, chose Kyorik. A CERN icebreaker fell into a frenzy upon his rejection. He lurched over the Nords attending the moot and swore he would kill everyone who opposed his rule. The quiet Kyorik stood and faced a CERN and challenged him to a duel. To the shock of everyone in attendance, Kyorik was victorious and his prowess was never again called into question. Cyrodiil's Emperor Gorius had been impressed by Kyorik's first nine years as Skyrim's monarch and formally invited the High King to his coronation. Alas, their acquaintanceship came to an end when the forces of Skyrim and the Cyrodiilic Empire clashed. Kyorik was killed on the battlefield near Falkreath, and the King's Moot chose his son as his successor. This heir was the infamous elf slayer named Hoag Murkiller, and while his reign was short-lived, Hoag's reputation as a legendary warrior and skilled tongue would see him immortalised as a role model to Skyrim's most formidable fighters. Hoag was heavily involved in the conquest of Morrowind, and the tales tell that Hoag destroyed 17 Kaima villages and two Dwemer strongholds. Vivek even writes about Hoag in his 36 lessons, referring to him as Hoga, the Mouth of Mud. He writes, Hoga, Mouth of Mud, who appeared as a great bearded king, had the powers of marshalling and breathing the earth. On the battlefields, this demon would often be seen on the sidelines, eating the soil voraciously. When his men fell, Hoga would fill their bellies back with it, whereupon they would rise again and fight, albeit slower. He had a secret name, Fenya, and destroyed 17 Chimeri villages and two Dwemeri strongholds before being turned away. Vivek's recounts are ever cryptic and always questionable, but it seems that Hoag was a powerful tongue with an affinity for unknown earth-based shouts. This conquest saw Hoag attain the Murkiller moniker. When and where Hoag was slain isn't certain, but we do know he died a warrior's death, and as befits his name, he died fighting elves, with Dereni blood on his hands. During his reign, he had aligned with the Cyrodiilic Empire and fought alongside them against the Dereni clan of High Rock. Most sources claim he died in the Battle of Glenumbra Moors, while some say he died in Skyrim, in the same spot as his father. We could continue this trend of talking about successive kings, but the next of Skyrim's High Kings was truly legendary, and we won't be talking about him until the end of this video. We're almost finished with the honourable mentions now, but I thought I would spare a few sentences for a man named General Talos. To say he was a great man would be quite the understatement. General Talos, of course, became Tiber Septim, the founder of the Septim dynasty, and then the ascended god Talos. But I'm going to save his story for another race's list, where he goes by the name Hjalti Earlybeard, as we have no shortage of Nordic heroes to discuss now. And so, with that, we reach the top 10. Each of the following Nords achieved a great deal, and I don't think it's possible for me to determine an order that absolutely everyone would agree with. This list is of course somewhat subjective, but I've tried my best to objectively weigh up all of their achievements. Coming in at number 10, we have a trio of legendary Nord warriors hailing from the distant Morefic era. Gormleif Goldenhilt, Feldir the Old, and Hakon One-Eye were prominent figures in the Dragon War. When Kynan and Parfenax bestowed the powers of the voice upon the Northmen, these three leaders learned the words needed to defeat Alduin the World Eater on the summit of the Throat of the World. They used an Elder Scroll to send the defeated dragon forward in time, freeing the subjugated Nords from draconic oppression. When Alduin returned, the spirits of Gormleif, Feldir, and Hakon finished their millennia-spanning mission, defeating the World Eater once and for all alongside the last Dragonborn. In ninth place, we have a warrior who fights with the strength of a giant, and that's because she literally has giant's blood in her veins. This reality proved fatal for her Nord mother, who died during childbirth. Her sacrifice was not in vain though, as this giant Nord played a major role in bringing an end to Molag Bao's plain meld invasion. This Nord was named Lyris Titanborn, 
Lyris was a member of Emperor Varan Aquilarios' personal guard during the plane meld, and was a member of the Five Companions. She helped track down the Amulet of Kings, but after Manamarco's subsequent betrayal, she was imprisoned in Bao's realm of Cold Harbor. With the help of the Vestige, she escaped captivity and ended the plane meld, and after sacrificing herself for a ritual to power the Amulet of Kings, she escaped the Daedric Prince of Enslavement's clutches a second time. She spent her following years aiding in the reconstruction of the Abbey of the Blades, before returning to Skyrim to help thwart the Ice Reach Coven of Witches. She then helped the Vestige investigate the rising vampiric threat in the north. Sharing the number 8 spot, we have a pair of brothers named Fieldgore Orkvane and Joran Skald King. Matters of kingship are supposed to be straightforward enough, to avoid civil war every time a ruler dies. Either a gathering of lords votes for the strongest among them, or the throne passes to the oldest male heir. Unfortunately for Fieldgore Strong Prince and Joran Skald Prince, being twins tends to complicate matters. Both brothers had reputations as powerful combatants and proven leaders, but only one would become High King of Skyrim. Fieldgore spent his young life among the Stormfist clan of Western Skyrim, where he was turned into a warrior. Despite not being a Stormfist by birth, he was chosen as the leader of the Stormfist Brigade when the Akaviri Kamal Snow Demons landed on the northern shores. Joran, on the other hand, travelled to many places in his youth, learning from a variety of cultures. He spent time in the Dunmary capital of Mournhold, as well as the Argonian city of Stormhold. He visited the small settlement of Such on Cyrodiil's Gold Coast and Hammerfell's city of mages Elinhir. As a result, his combat training was gathered through experience as a wandering knight errant. Joran and his allies failed to stop the sacking of Windhelm, but he did travel to High Hrothgar, where he learned a shout that could summon the Ash King of Legend. Both Fildgore and Joran were crucial in defeating the Akaviri invaders, but when the crisis was averted and the dust cleared, the twins were both eligible to the title of High King, and of course, both men claimed it. Fieldgore and Joran fought in single combat, sacrificing their filial bond to avoid all-out civil war in the wake of the already devastating invasion. Joran emerged victorious and proved himself to be the greater of the brothers. Fieldgore was bested but not killed, so Joran exiled him. Fieldgore rallied an army of orcs and attempted to usurp the throne by claiming the favour of the Crown of Verity, but the plot ultimately failed, and Joran Skald King ruled uncontested as High King. Coming in at number 7, we have a Nord who never wore a crown, and didn't forge a reputation by the blade. This Nord was instead an immensely powerful and influential wizard. His arcane achievements are surrounded by myth and legend, and despite living in the early First Era, remnants of his legacy are seen both in Skyrim and all over Tamriel to the modern day. If you spend the night in one of Skyrim's many taverns, you might hear the bards sing of Shalador, building the city of Winterhold with nothing more than a whispered incantation, or how he came face to face with the dragon god of time, leaving only once he had learned the secret of life. Life. Or perhaps they'll inspire the mead-drunk patrons with the tale of Shalador single-handedly fighting an army of desert-dwelling dwarves in the Battle of Rork and Shalador. You won't find many figures from the First Era with perfectly accurate histories. Embellishment is inevitable with cultural heroes, but even if these stories are played up or made up, one thing that isn't in doubt is Shalador's role in pushing for higher standards among mages. He staunchly believed that magic should be used responsibly by trained mages, and should not be employed freely by the common castes. Even though it seems more likely that Vanus Galerian was responsible for organising magic into schools and implementing institutions of magical learning, there's no doubt that Shalador also played a significant role in encouraging these reforms. There isn't clear evidence, but I think it's reasonable to assume that Shalador founded the College of Winterhold, even if he alone didn't popularise arcane elitism. During Shalador's time, the requirement to begin training as a wizard would have been higher than merely showing Feralda your mage light spell. He was so dedicated to the cause that he isolated himself in the ruins of the old dragon citadel of Bromjanar. Here he constructed his ultimate test, a labyrinth, the namesake for Labyrinthian. When he wasn't perfecting his maze, he was writing about his magical discoveries. Thousands of years later, mages still long to find the remnants of his notes in those ancient Nordic ruins. This labyrinth is said to contain what the elves call Glamoral, the secret of life. 
in the number six spot, we have an ancient Nord who fought on the other side of the Dragon War. This Nord was a member of the Dragon Cult, and he refused to aid Hakon One-Eye and his companions in their plight, believing that if he wanted Alduin dead, he could do it alone. This Dragon Priest was named Mirak, and he was the first known Dragonborn. His ambition took him beyond the limits of mortality. His search for knowledge and power took him to the Daedra Lord Hermaeus Mora, and Mirak soon became the Prince's champion. Mora taught Marak to bend the will of dragons, and when combined with his innate dragonborn powers, he was unstoppable. He turned on his dragon overlords, absorbing the souls of those he slew, and he enjoyed an immortal existence in Mora's realm of Apocrypha, where all the universe's best kept secrets were stored. It is said that Marak's clash with another dragon priest, by the name of Varlok the Jailer, was so destructive that it caused the Isle of Solstheim to break free from mainland Skyrim. Varlok was victorious in this duel, but Marak was saved by Mora, who rescued him from the Jailer's killing blow. This defeat would be Marak's last for thousands of years. Serving Hermaeus Mora had been a blessing at first, but Marak eventually began to feel imprisoned in the Prince's endless library. So he started planning his escape. He used his arcane powers to influence the people of Solstheim, who rebuilt his temple and erected arches around the island's stones of power. Most of his servants were unwilling, their subconscious minds enslaved by Marak. But others came to him in awe and veneration, and a cult devoted to him rose in popularity. These followers anticipated the return of the first Dragonborn. But Marak's scheming did not go unnoticed by the Prince of Forbidden Knowledge, and Hermaeus Mora's favour transferred to the last Dragonborn, the individual who would bring Marak's long life to an end at the summit of Apocrypha. Now we reach our top five, and in fifth place we have an individual who is deeply embroiled in the politics of the present day, the 201st year of the Fourth Era. This Nord is named Ulfric Stormcloak. He is a divisive figure, disdained by those loyal to the Empire, but revered by the sons and daughters of Skyrim. The Jarl of Windhelm spent his early life among the Greybeards of High Hrothgar. Here he learned to harness the Fum, and by the time of the Great War, he was a powerful military leader. Ulfric was captured by the Dominion during this time and interrogated. He escaped to find his home province in turmoil. Opportunistic Reachmen had laid claim to Markarth, and the conclusion of the war had seen Talos worship abolished. A staunch believer of Talos, Ulfric opposed this concession. At this point, Markarth had been in forsworn hands for two years, and unrest in the city had died down. But the Nords did not wish to have an independent Reachman kingdom within their borders, so the High King offered Ulfric a proposal. If he could reclaim the city with his militia, then he would be permitted to reinstitute Talos worship. Ulfric laid siege to the gates of Markarth, and it is said that he shouted the gates open. Such was the strength of his form. He captured the city and overthrew Madanach, the Forsworn leader. With the city under his control, Ulfric refused to cede it until free Talos worship was guaranteed. The Dominion learned of the deal, and the violation of the White Gold Concordat. Their contingency came and demanded the arrest of Ulfric. While imprisoned, Ulfric's father died, and he was forced to deliver his eulogy via a letter smuggled from jail. Eventually he was freed, and he returned to Windhelm as Jarl. Opinions of Ulfric vary. Imperial sources claim he was brutal in his taking of Markarth, and every officer was put to the sword, even those who surrendered. But this is an imperial source, so it should absolutely be taken with a grain of salt. The other argument would be that Ulfric was taken advantage of by the other major powers in Skyrim. He was given an empty promise of free worship, so that he would get his hands dirty on their behalf and once he succeeded, he was thrown in prison. It should come as no surprise that the Stormcloak Rebellion began almost as soon as Ulfric returned to the Palace of Kings in Windhelm. At the moot following High King Islod's death, Ulfric voiced his desire for an independent Skyrim. The new High King Torig did not give an immediate answer. But his answer would never come, as Ulfric challenged High King Torig to a duel, invoking old Nordic traditions to force the monarch's hand. Some say Ulfric used the Fum to topple Torig before killing him by the sword. Others claim he literally shouted the High King asunder. Whatever the case, Ulfric's uprising would not go unnoticed now, but the conclusion to Ulfric's rebellion remains unclear. In fourth place, we have two High Kings, a father and son, who achieved a great deal in the early First Era. 
The former ruled for 78 years, while the latter continued his father's work in the following decades. The first of these ancient high kings was named Harold Handfree, the 13th descendant of Isgrimor's line. It was at the beginning of Harold's reign, First Era 143, that the last of the surface-dwelling elves were driven from Skyrim, finishing the conflict that began with the Night of Tears. Harold officially relinquished all holdings in Atmora to focus on creating a new Nordic nation in Skyrim, and he was the monarch responsible for choosing Windhelm as the nation's capital. Harold is also responsible for wiping out the last known active dragon priests in Skyrim. Harold defeated the treacherous sons of Archmage Galder, and while the exact origins of it aren't certain, it seems as though Skyrim's foremost symbol of office, the Jagged Crown, was introduced early in Harold's reign. The King's Moot, a convention of Skyrim's Jarls to determine the new High King, was also introduced during Harold's reign. Harold's long and prosperous tenure is immortalised thanks to the advances his kingdom made in regards to scholarship and record keeping. It seems as though Harold's ambitions were not limited to forging a kingdom. He dreamed of an empire of Nords, and began setting it in motion before his death. At the age of 108, he finally died, and High King Hjalmar, Harold's oldest living son, claimed the throne. This was short-lived though, as Hjalmar died one year into his reign. As a result, Harold's youngest living legitimate son, Vraga the Gifted, inherited his jagged crown. Vraga continued his father's legacy, founding the first empire of the Nords after growing his domain to encompass large parts of High Rock, Morrowind and Eastern Cyrodiil. It is commonly held that Harold and Vraga were the catalysts for man's lasting dominance over the elves in High Rock and Cyrodiil. Morrowind proved too wild to be tamed by men despite Vraga's best efforts. But that brings us to our top three. And taking the bronze, we have a Nord who changed the way the Children of the Sky perceived their god-given powers over the breath and the voice. This Nord became a hero on more than just combat prowess. In fact, his greatest claim to fame was his ability to subdue his immense power. His name was Jürgen Windcaller, aptly nicknamed Jürgen the Calm. Of all the powerful Nord tongues to emerge in the wake of the Dragon War, it is said that Jürgen Windcaller had the strongest gift. But after seeing the Empire of Nords suffer a disheartening defeat to the unified Dwemer and Kaima forces at Red Mountain, Jürgen began to wonder where his people had strayed from Kain's path. The dragons had used their voices to enslave men, and they had been punished for it. Now the Nords, who conquered so much of Tamriel with Kain's blessing, were experiencing their own retribution. The tongues at Red Mountain went away humbled, so Jürgen Windcaller began his seven-year meditation to understand how strong voices could fail. He chose silence, and his detractors could not shout him down. Jürgen began a monastic order called the Greybeards, and with his followers he built High Hrothgar, where responsible voices could study the voice, and how to speak only in true need. Jürgen revolutionised the way the Nords viewed the voice. It was not a tool for war, but rather a means of attaining enlightenment. Now he feasts for eternity in Sovngarde. Taking the silver, we have the most mysterious figure in Skyrim's history. He goes by many names. Izmir, Dragon of the North, Breath of Kain, Shaw's Tongue, the Grey Wind, the Storm of Kain, the Kingmaker, the Ash King. But if you do know of him, you would know him as High King Wolfhalf. As a man, Wolfhalf was born in Atmora, and ascended to Skyrim's throne after the death of Hoag Murkiller. He reinstated the ancient Nordic pantheon, the animal totem gods, and he did not abide the Elysian religion of the Eight in his domain. He drove the Dureni from Skyrim, and ruled for 53 years. He was also a dragonborn, but some would question whether Wolfhalf was ever a man at all, for he is shrouded in a great deal of myth and controversy. Most of what we know about this High King comes from the five songs of King Wolfhalf. The songs say he had such a powerful voice that he could not physically swear into office, lest he reap destruction at his own coronation. In purging the Elysian Doctrine from Skyrim, Wolfhalf undid all of High King Borgus' work, and for his zealotry he adopted the names Izmir, Dragon of the North, and Shaw's Tongue, for Shaw was the ancient Nordic version of Lorcan. On top of ridding Skyrim of the Dureni, Wolfhalf is credited with wiping out a huge number of Eastern Orcs. The songs say he shouted their chief into oblivion. When he swallowed a thundercloud to keep his army from catching cold, the Nords called him the Breath of Kine. Perhaps the most bizarre of King Wolfhalf's songs was the one about Old Knocker. Orky was an enemy god to the Nords, and he summoned Alduin the World Eater when he saw Wolfhalf's unbridled power. 
They say Alduin ate all the Nords down to six years old, meaning Wolfhalf and the people of Skyrim were all instantaneously transformed into toddlers. But Wolfhalf pleaded to Shaw, and the god fought on behalf of the Nords. Shaw was victorious, and Orki's followers, the Orsima, were cursed with shortened lifespans. When Wolfhalf shouted his people back to normal, he shook too many years out on himself and died. The flames of his pyre were said to have reached the half of Kain itself. But that was not the end for Wolfhalf. He had many more names yet to acquire. The Battle of Red Mountain erupted in Morrowind over contentions about the still beating heart of Shaw. This of course piqued the interest of Shaw's tongue. The tongue sang Shaw's ghost into the world again. Shaw gathered an army as he did of old, and then he sucked in the long-strewn ashes of King Wolfhalf and remade him, for he needed a good general. Thus Wolfhalf the Ash King was reborn. Whatever truth we take from Wolfhalf's story so far, there is no doubt that everything from here does not involve the human High King Wolfhalf. This Wolfhalf was closer to an avatar of Shaw, a Shezarin. Wolfhalf rode the great Senchcat Drozira up the face of Red Mountain, and supposedly killed Jumak, the King of the Dwarves. He was then blasted back to Ash by Nerevar's companions. But this idea is quite controversial, and other songs say Shaw was killed in the Heart Chamber by the assembled Dwemer and Kaima. Without Shaw, the Ash King could not keep his corporeal form. It is said that Wolfhalf was summoned once again to stop the Akaviri invasion of the Second Era, and then again by the Greybeards during the Interregnum. But Wolfhalf was not the chosen one the Greybeards called upon. That was Tiber Septim. What became of Wolfhalf from here is even more complicated than what we've discussed so far. And if you'd like to learn more about the Ash King's fate, I suggest watching Scott's video on Talos, the god of free parts. Perhaps there is no Nord as great as Wolfhalf, but his tale seems to be closer to mythology than truth. And he became detached from mortality a short distance into his story. But in first place we have a mortal, a Nord who paved the way for his entire race to follow. He is the reason Skyrim truly belongs to the Nords, for he is the harbinger of us all. His name is Isgrimor, the first Atmoran king of Skyrim. Contrary to popular belief, Isgrimor was not the first man to settle Tamriel, as Nedic migrations across the continent's north predate his adventures. But Isgrimor was the most successful, and benefited from being a skilled writer. He is often referred to as the bringer of words, and that's because he is the first known human to transcribe Nordic speech using elven principles of writing, which makes him one of the first, if not the first, human historian. No wonder he is so well remembered by men. He introduced them to documenting history. He came to Skyrim in the Morefic Era, and his dynasty would rule the North until the 369th year of the First Era. Isgrimor was among the wave of Atmorans who established the city of Sarfal in Skyrim, but when they unearthed an ancient artifact, the otherwise peaceful Snow Elves attacked. The exact cause for this attack isn't explicitly stated, but it's heavily implied that the Falmer became hostile after learning of the Atmorans discovering the Eye of Magnus. Isgrimor and his sons were the only survivors of this bloody Night of Tears. They returned to Atmora to rally the greatest warriors of their race, before setting sail south in search of vengeance. Isgrimor and his 500 companions tore across Skyrim, claiming every piece of land they crossed. It was a costly endeavour, and Isgrimor's eldest son was lost on the voyage across the Sea of Ghosts. It's said that Isgrimor braved a mighty storm on the open sea in search of his lost son, and slew a dozen dozen beasts in his grief. But the rest of his quest would prove more fruitful. He reclaimed Sarfal, he built the city of Windhelm in honour of his son, and the companions pressed on the crew of each ship in the fleet travelling in separate directions, and as they went they discovered more and more of their new home, Skyrim. Everywhere they went, they wiped out every elf they could find. So complete was their desire to avenge the Night of Tears. Isgrimor and his companions waged war against the giants of the North too, but the Snow Elves were the priority. Eventually, the Elven Scourge was completely eradicated on the mainland, leaving only Solstheim. In a costly battle beneath the Mosering Mountains, the Snow Elves were defeated once and for all. The songs of the return are eternal and numerous. For those first 500, those companions of Isgrimor, who cleared the way for mankind's rightful habitation, burned with a fire not seen since those days long past.
Each ship carried a crew that performed legendary feats that could feed the pride of any nation for a thousand years. And during this time of the broadening, scores of companions wandered the land, bringing the light of the proper gods to the heathen land of elves and beasts. When news spread that Isgrimor breathed his last, it was as if a dark cloud washed over Tamriel from horizon to horizon. The day's brilliant lights went out in silent honour for their fallen general and war leader. While future Nords know only Isgrimor's glory as it gleams through history, the 500 companions knew his might with their own eyes. And such a loss hung so heavily on the heart that mere words cannot express the altering of their world. Isgrimor, the first king of the Nords, the harbinger of us all, Wulfrad in hand, is the father of Skyrim, and you won't find a Nord in the north who is not empowered by the mere utterance of his name. And that's why Isgrimor is the greatest Nord of all time. I hope you enjoyed the video guys, thanks so much for watching. I've been Drew, this has been Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.